Hello, my name is Aaron Hanson and I'm a medical oncologist at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane and I'm also the co-convener of uh, the 2024 ANZUP uh, annual scientific meeting here at the Gold Coast. It's a real uh, privilege for me today to be talking to an old friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Hamilton, um, who has been our esteemed guest uh, and neurologist. He has multiple hats, multiple areas of expertise, um, and uh, we invited him uh, to the ASM to discuss his views and uh, his perspectives on testis cancer. And the theme for the ASM was making waves. And so I'd like to throw to Dr. Hamilton now to find out from him what he thought the main waves were in testis cancer. Well, thanks, Aaron. It's my, my pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Australia, so I was honored to be invited. Uh, and it was a great session that we had this morning across all the diseases. But in testis cancer, um, I, I sort of admitted to the fact that in the last 30 years, we haven't had great big waves. But in the last three or four or five years, we're starting to see the inklings of waves coming. And I, I, it's hard. You can't pick them all, but I picked three. Um, the first was that we have some new data in prognostication of stage one seminoma. The second was that we have some new treatment paradigms for stage two seminoma. And then the third was uh, what, what a lot of us in testis cancer think is going to be a, a big breakthrough, which is the biomarker of microRNA in testicular cancer. Could you talk a little bit more about the new stage one uh, prognostication and how you see that getting integrated into care? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question. And, you know, we've had relatively stagnant understanding for the last 20 years in that space. We've sort of, um, when a patient undergoes an orchiectomy and they have no evidence of metastatic disease and their markers are negative, we call them stage one. Most guidelines have come around to say that surveillance is the preferred approach. Uh, and one of the reasons, two of the reasons, I guess, one is that um, no matter how you treat those patients, whether you give them adjuvant therapy, such as carboplatin, uh, or whether you just watch them, their cancer-specific survival is 99%. And so we've sort of acknowledged that anytime you over-treat them, any, or anytime you treat a patient in that category, it's, you're, you're probably over-treating them since surveillance achieves uh, just as good cancer-specific survival. The other reason why surveillance has been preferred for a long time is because we haven't had any reliable, robust prognostic uh, markers that can tell us who's going to relapse and who's not. And so what I highlighted today was that First time in a while, we have some new evidence that suggests there may be some uh, models, nomograms, if you will, that can predict who might be at higher risk of relapse. And there are some of our old factors that we're used to. So for example, rete testis invasion, tumor size, depending on which uh, model you're looking at. But there are some new factors, hyalur soft tissue invasion, tumor marker elevation before the orchiectomy for the first time has ever shown up as being prognostic. And when you combine a lot of this information now, you can actually identify a group that is at higher risk for relapse. But what I pointed out was that this is a very small subset of all the seminoma patients that we see. And it's not like there's a 100% chance of relapse in the group. It ranges between 40, the highest in the, in the uh, Danish uh, database was 60%. So when you put all of that together, I still think that um, you, you can salvage relapses that you watch on surveillance. And since it's such a small percentage of the patients that actually fall into that high-risk category, the concept of giving them carboplatin, when we don't yet know how those patients are going to benefit from that one cycle of carbo, if you have a 60% estimated risk of relapse, until we have that data, we at Princess Margaret in, in, in Toronto, and, and I think a lot of the world still prefers surveillance uh, for those patients, even in the highest risk group. At least that's that's my take on the data. Yeah. I think it's interesting. It'd be good if we could drill down a little bit more into that because we had a masterclass yesterday uh, on uh, testis cancer, specifically looking at adjuvant treatment in stage one seminoma. Uh, there was some data presented around adjuvant carboplatin. Yes. Um, I was really interested to get your take. Yeah, so I, I, I must admit, as a Canadian coming over here, I was a little surprised. Um, I, I think I can speak for the average flavor in, in Canada that most 
clinicians who treat testis cancer would choose surveillance for a patient with stage one seminoma, regardless of factors. Um, and certainly our Canadian guideline, uh, which I was privileged to lead, that was a unanimous recommendation in our guideline, no questions asked. And so I was a little surprised to see, and I, I thought coming in here that um, the Australian New Zealand climate would, would be of the same mindset towards surveillance, but I was surprised to see some of the answers to the, to the polling questions was showing that at least a third, sometimes a half, depending on the scenario, we're voting for adjuvant therapy for seminoma and non-seminoma. Um, and I think we have to be a little bit careful because, again, these are young men. Whatever, However you treat them now, they're going to carry the burden of that treatment into their 70s and 80s. And we know now there's robust studies looking at chemotherapy and radiation therapy that shows that anytime you do something more than the surgical intervention of the orchiectomy, you are layering on potential cardiac toxicity and risk of secondary malignant neoplasm. Um, maybe that's less with carbo. For sure it is less with carboplatin, but um, it's, it's not, the toxicity is not zero. And again, coming back to that tenant that you can, we're, we're able to salvage the, the men who are unlucky enough to relapse on active surveillance to the, to the tune of 99% plus cancer specific survival. And so any treatment for these men on top of that I think is over treatment. And so um, we had a, 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 a hearty discussion about that in the master class. And so uh, uh, it's, I, it was just eye opening for me to see the Australian perspective on it. I think it was really good to be able to share that. I think it also raises for me some questions around where should these folks be treated? And, uh, you know, it would seem probably most appropriate that they should be treated in high volume centers with expertise in this in this field? Yeah, so you, you raise a very good point. And I think um, people often think, oh, high volume centers, sure, for really complex uh, tertiary treatments, whether it's complex systemic therapy or complex surgeries that only a handful of people can do. But there's, there's, more, there's more to that in terms of the centralization of, of care. And some of it can be that upfront, what one would argue is maybe a simple decision of adjuvant treatment versus no adjuvant treatment. But there's an advantage to being at a being treated or at least seen or advised by a center that has a lot of experience with it, really understands the data and can help inform the patients so they, you can make a shared decision about that. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. Um, maybe now we could transition to talk about that second wave that you're referring yeah. to with the new paradigms potentially that are evolving for uh, stage two seminar. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Stage two has been Again, sort of theme here for 20, 30 years, we've treated either with radiation or chemotherapy. Depends on how big the nodal disease of the seminoma is. Uh, and we haven't had any kind of new advances in that space for a long time, but in the last year and a half, we've had two new um, paradigms is what we'll call them. Um, the first being that you start the induction chemotherapy and then you PET scan them after two cycles of, uh, let's say a topside and uh, cisplatin. If the PET is negative, the trial looked at decreasing the, the chemotherapy that you gave, and instead of giving finishing the two cycles of EP, you give one cycle of carbo. And what they showed was that the progression-free survival at three years was identical to the group that had a positive PET midway through treatment and completed the four cycles of EP. And so the progression-free survival was 91% versus 90%, and so the, tr the trial concluded that this de-escalation type strategy where you give less chemotherapy is, is a viable uh, option. Um, my take on that, though, is a little bit less positive in the sense that you've taken a group that was very good responders, and by taking your foot off the gas uh, in terms of what treatments you give, you've sort of brought their survival potentially down to the level that's equivalent to the bad responders, the pet positive group. And so I'm not so sure that's a success story. Personally, that's my take on it. And the second paradigm is um, the concept of instead of giving uh, just high dose chemotherapy or giving um, full uh, radiation to the classic sort of periodic or dog leg field, you give a little bit of chemotherapy, carboplatin, and you give a little bit of radiation. So what, what's called involved node radiation. And that study showed a very impressive three year progression free survival of almost 94%. So that, that's encouraging, but again, now you're combining two modalities, a radiation modality and a chemotherapy modality. We know from the historical data, which you can argue maybe is not applicable, but the historical data would suggest that those patients who got combined modalities had the worst long-term toxicity. 
So I think we have to be a little careful before we embrace embrace that uh, those two paradigms. Yeah, it seems like we could be getting a little too cute with some of these uh, options yes. and regimens and for the benefit, which we still need to explore, possibly a little um, questionable. Yes. So um, just to wrap up, I know this is a real passion project of yours, the microRNA. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about where you see that field is, where you see it going? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a great question. And, and it's nice in Tesla's cancer to have something really tangible, especially with a translational uh, a theme to it. Um, so this concept of looking at microRNA or very small components of, of RNA that are not translated into protein. So they, they modify uh, uh, you know, genes as they are translated into protein. That's how they work. Uh, and it seems that there's a cluster of these that are overexpressed in germ cell tumors specifically, no other tumors. And they can be detected in serum so you ha or, or blood, serum or plasma. So you have the potential of a liquid biomarker uh, for the first time in, in uh, a robust liquid biomarker for the first time in testis cancer. And I sort of highlighted that we're not there yet. Uh, uh, we know that it works well in an artificial scenario where you have known germ cell tumors against known healthy patients. But what we don't know is how can it perform in the sort of clinical questions that are relevant to us as clinicians and patients. And we're getting there. And I highlighted uh, a couple of scenarios. And uh, in particular, I looked at the post-chemotherapy mass where it seems like the microRNA can pretty robustly tell you who has viable germ cell tumor and who doesn't, but it can't predict your risk of teratoma. Um, it doesn't seem, at least in our data that we showed, it doesn't prognosticate in stage one. So you can't figure out post archaeectomy who's going to relapse and who's not, but it may have utility as a marker of relapse detection and might allow us to pick up the relapses earlier. And the final um, space where I alluded to was in the small testis mass, which is increasingly becoming a problem that shows up in our door, certainly as urologists. Uh, and and I, we have a re both a retrospective and prospective study that we're working on at Princess Margaret. And I, I hinted to some of the data that we have today that um, it seems like the microRNA could perform very well in that sort of small testis mass, discriminating the cancerous lesions from the not cancerous lesions. And maybe that lead, lead clinicians to decide, well, that's the patient I need to intervene on surgically, either with a radical orchiectomy or a partial orchiectomy and I can feel safe watching the ones with, that are microRNA negative. But I concluded by saying, well, we have to work on the assay. We have to figure out what the best way to, to test this is because we saw some differences across the different analytic types, analytic methods. It's a really exciting time to see this uh, emerging data. And you know, I've been very impressed with all the work that you've been doing in this field. It'll be exciting to see where this goes into the future. And so I really appreciate you coming to the Gold Coast to share with us your expertise and your insights in testis cancer. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.